Amen. I want you to remain standing if you would. And uh, I kind of titled this message Nicodemus versus the Corinthian. And I'll maybe explain that a little bit more. But I, I, I want to I speak more from my heart. I want you to listen closely. Wednesday night was really kind of a theophany for me. Sheila, Philip Bird made this statement one time, undoubtedly uh, he's still sleeping, Philip's usually here, but Philip made this statement, he said, Brother Jeff, I don't, mean to, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I want you to know I love Wednesday nights. I just love on Wednesday night because there's such a casualness about it. Uh, just a, It's like a family gathering, and we're just talking about the Word of God. I put on Facebook this yesterday this statement, I said, a life-changing moment was when someone questioned me about my extravagance in parenting, to which I answered this person, if I fail as a parent, I will fail on loving my children too much. Okay? In other words, when questioned about my commitment to be a parent and, and, and what I do for my children, that it, it might be a little too extravagant or it might be too much or, or you go, go too far. My response to that was, well, I made myself a promise if I fail in parenting, I will fail in loving my children too much. Every time I say that, I feel the presence of God's Holy Spirit in me in a way like none other. Now let me say that again. Whenever I make that statement, I feel the presence of God's indwelling Holy Spirit affirming that statement so strongly that I literally can feel him all around me. Because in that moment, he says, as the eternal Father, the sovereign God, he says, I am the same. God loves the world. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we're beginning, we're beginning a series on Corinthians, but we're going to go about it a little differently. Paul's writing to a church that just pretty much would look like they were in Las Vegas. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty bad city. And this was a very, very difficult place to plant a church. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and we're, we're not going to necessarily be doing a normal introduction, so I'll be doing that next week. But anyway, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse, verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sothosthenes, and I can't say it with this stupid thing in my mouth. <laughs> Sucking sucker tash or whatever he says, uh, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, I want you to see that, sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. He calls them saints, hagias, holy. He says they're sanctified, hagiasmas, which means that they're already positionally holy, perfect, blameless, positionally in Christ. Please hear that. Please hang on to that. This is a church practically that is not living out the faith. The culture of Corinth has come into their lives they are getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. There's such sexual immorality that Paul said it's even worse than the Gentiles. They're taking each other to court. They're in court suing one another. They're getting, they're, they're, there's just absolute wickedness and debauchery in the church at Corinth. And yet Paul says you're holy and you're sanctified positionally because you are in Christ. Let me pray again. Lord, we thank you. We love you. And we pray you guide us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. 
I want you to take a, a left and I want you to go to the Gospel of John. And, and I want you to do something for me this morning. I, I, know, I know in an environment like we're in right now, we're still in the COVID environment. We're still in the process of, of eventually having children's church, Sunday school, and a lot of other activities. Kids are in here. It's easy to get distracted. I understand that. And a lot of times we take, I mean, I thank God for those that eventually they just say, listen, I'll watch your kids. I'll do this and do that. Beginning Easter Sunday, we're going back to our full schedule, Sunday school, children's activities. We'll be very, uh, very much back to normal. But until we do, I, I need you to listen closely this morning. And I, in, in the first point, I said, in this corner, we have Nicodemus. And in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, it said, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus declared to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can sing, see the kingdom of God unless a man be born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wills, pleases you hear it sound but you cannot tell where it comes from and from where it is going so it is with everyone born of the spirit now stay with me verse 9 how can this be Nicodemus asked now look at Jesus's words you are a teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things it's the definite article we talked about this Wednesday night Jesus was not saying Nicodemus you are a teacher he was saying, Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. You are a member of the Sanhedrin. You're a Pharisee. There are about 6,000 Pharisees. You're not just a Pharisee. You are the Pharisee, the teacher of Israel. You're a member of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Israelite community. You are the most powerful figure perhaps in all of the Jewish nation, and you do not understand these things, Nicodemus. Something's wrong. We got a church member, former member of this church, that has moved into an area of dialogue on Facebook that is very, very troubling to me, not for the information so much as for the person. Because I think sometimes you and I have to be careful. And I and on on Facebook I put this statement the most dangerous threat to the unbeliever and the believer alike is to misunderstand the Old Testament and the law of God. Nicodemus was trapped in the Old Testament and he had to be set free. And what Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, you're the, the teacher of Israel. You have memorized the Old Testament, and yet you have forgotten that all of the Old Testament was pointing to me and the cross. Nicodemus, you missed the very theme of the book, the thesis. Now, how does that happen? How does that happen? I want you to take a right from John chapter 3, and I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Paul, again, is writing another letter to the church of Corinth. Now listen to what Paul said. Paul said, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses. Now watch this, stay with me. Those on Wednesday night will know where I'm coming from here. We are not like Moses, Paul said, who would put a veil over his face. Now, remember, look this way. Paul uses a personal pronoun, we, meaning that Paul was including the Corinthians with him. 
with all of their practical problems, positionally they were in Christ. With all of the sexual immorality, with all the cultural baggage that they carried, with all the lawsuits, with all the getting drunk in the Lord's, at the Lord's Supper, with all the debauchery and all the misbehavior and all of the wrong, Paul says, listen, we, Corinth, we in Christ, watch what Paul says, we are very bold, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Now I want you to stay with me. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains, watch this, when the old covenant is read, it has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. You see, what Paul said was what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. He was saying, Nicodemus, there is a veil over your heart, over your mind. And what you need is you need God to cut it away. And you may say, well, what is the veil? You remember in the Old Testament when Moses came down off the Mount, Mount Sinai? The Bible says that Shekinah glory, the very glory of God, radiated from his face. When he came down, the people literally said, Moses, we can't take that. It frightened them. And so Moses put a veil over his face. Now, two reasons. Number one, because the people asked him to do it. Secondly, listen, because the radiance, the Shekinah glory of God was fading away. Now, what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth and the danger to the unbeliever and the believer alike is that you and I allow the veil, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant to be understood in a way that God never intended it to be understood. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you are trapped, you are caught, you are held prisoner in what God simply meant as a school teacher to point you to me and to point you to the cross. He said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel, but you just don't understand. You know the scripture. You've memorized the Old Testament. You are spiritually, outwardly, you look just grand to the nation of Israel. But oh, Nicodemus, you forget that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Nicodemus, you fail. It's a veil. What is the veil? Paul says in verse 14, he said, look at this. He said, their minds were made dull for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant, the word old covenant, Old Testament, the Levitical law, the sacrificial system. You remember the Levitical law, sacrificial system. This is so important. I need you to stay with me here. And I know it's difficult the Levitical law, the sacrificial system, everything was pointing to the cross. When Jesus approached the Jordan River, John the Baptist looked and said, Behold the Lamb of God who washes away the sins of the world. What John the Baptist recognized that Nicodemus did not, that the Old Testament, the law, the festivals, all of the, everything literally was pointing to to the Savior, pointing to Jesus. And the great threat to all of us is, is that veil is cut away and we put it back on again. Think about it. All the religions of the world are based on works. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them. Basically, man, even lost man, an atheist, an agnostic, they all see it as simply this. We come to the end of our life. If there is anything beyond this life, then it comes down to this. There is the good deeds of our life. There are the bad deeds of our life. And whichever way the, the scale tips is where we end up. If the good deeds went out, then we find our way in eternity, eternally in heaven. If the bad deeds outweigh, then we find ourselves in hell, eternally separated from our Creator God. If you look at most people and you ask them, are you saved, they will respond this way. I tried to do right. I tried to live right. I'm better than the people down there at the church. I grew up in the church. I do this. I do that. We are by nature captivated and consumed with this desire to work our way into heaven. And that was Nicodemus. 
this veil would keep Nicodemus from coming to Christ. Why? Because Nicodemus failed to understand the most basic part of the Old Testament. And it was simply this. Paul said it to the Galatians. He said the, the law was a school teacher to point you and I to the cross and to remind us that we can never be good enough for God. I often say this with all the good that I've done in my own life, it's not worth a rat's hair. I don't have a rat's hair chance of getting into heaven outside the grace and the mercy of God. And Nicodemus had to come to this point. That's why Jesus looked at Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel. You memorize the Old Testament. You're a member of the Sanhedrin. You're a Pharisee. But you don't understand this. Why? Because Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 14, 15, and 16, because he was held captive to a works salvation. What does it mean to remove the veil? It means when you and I come to the point that we realize that nothing we can ever do will save us. That's what it means. Past, present, or future. There's nothing we can do. You remember in Luke 15 when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. And the prodigal son takes his third of the inheritance and he goes, the Bible said, into a foreign land and he wasted on wild women, on gambling, on drunkenness. He lived this riotous life. He squandered the entire one-third of the estate, the market value of the estate, and he's finally in the pig pen. And the Bible said that he came to himself. Now, what does that mean? He came to the point that he recognized his condition. He knew where he was at, and he knew that there was no way to get him out of the situation that he was in. So he began, the Bible said he came to himself, and he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my father. Listen to me closely. Stay with me here. We may have to take that baby out to give them some relief, and me too. The reality is, is that the prodigal son came to the point the prodigal son realized it is not, a, listen, it is not about my character. It's about my father's character. Now I want you to hear me there. When Jesus, and that's the one story I believe he told, told with tears in his eyes, he said, listen, it's not about the prodigal realized, listen, it's not about my character. He came to himself. He recognized who he was. He even said, listen, when I go back to my father, he was sitting there rehearsing. He said, I know what I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Call me a servant. Make me a slave. Just let me live in your household. He wasn't banking anything on his character. He was banking all of it on the character of the father. Nicodemus would have to turn to be saved. Let me go back and read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at, at verse 14. But their minds, this is Nicodemus, but their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, Levitical law, the sacrificial system, the Ten Commandments, all of it, when it is read, it has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. And you may say, wait a minute, you mean I don't have to obey the law? I didn't say that. Because in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, you have the lawgiver now living inside of you. He's not telling you not to commit adultery. The Holy Spirit's now telling you not even to lust. So I come to the second point. In this corner, we have the Corinthian. And here the Corinthian is, they're living in the most corrupt city of their day. The word Corinth, Corinthian, was literally a slanderous way of calling somebody a heathen. Corinth was situated between north and south Greece. It was on a narrow isthmus, just a little narrow area, four miles wide. In fact, they eventually cut a canal through there. Caesar cut a, began to try to do it, and it was finished, I think, in the 1800s, where they cut a canal through to provide passage between them. But it was on a major trade route. Corinth was a Las Vegas of the New Testament. It was an evil city. And yet Paul addresses them as saints. Hagias. He says they've been sanctified. Hagiasmas. Why? Because he recognizes in all their moral failure 
They are positionally in Christ even though practically they are not living it out. Sometimes it's you and I, isn't it? We know positionally we are in Christ, but we live in a very, very corrupt environment, very corrupt culture, and it is hard practically to live this out. Holiness hurts. And God requires perfection, and I couldn't do that. Only Jesus Christ could do that. He imputed his righteousness to my life and all my sin, past, present, and future was imputed on his account and he went to the cross and paid my sin debt. That's it. Sheila and I watched Donna Reed show, Father Knows Best. I looked at her the other night as we were laying there watching Donna Reed. I said, boy, life was a lot simpler when it was in the 1950s and 60s, black and white TV when life was a lot simpler and you could turn the channels and not fear what you would come across to see. We live in a different day, a different culture. Culture seeped into our lives, seeped in even at times into the church. And yet Paul says to the Corinthians, he said, you're saints. You're a saint. Third, the great danger to both you and I, both the unbeliever and the believer is that we fail to understand the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. Take a right from 2 Corinthians and look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, you know what the writer of Hebrews says? Look at this, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, this is critical because the great danger to the unbeliever is the Old Testament, the law, the works mentality, that works thinking that thinks that somehow if I do enough good deeds, I'm going to tip the scales in my favor and one day God is going to wink at me and say, I know you were a bad boy, but you did a lot of good, come on into heaven. Or you were a bad girl, but you did a lot of good things, so come on into heaven. It's not like that. The writer of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1, says this, the law, talking about the Old Testament, talking about the Ten Commandments, talking about Levitical law, the sacrificial system, all of it, the law is only what? It's only in the NIV a shadow of the good things that are coming. In other words, the veil... In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14, 15, and 16, Paul said this. He said, when you and I are an unbeliever, when we're unsaved, when we're unconverted, when we're not a Christian, we are captivated and held into this veil, which means that we think we can earn our way to heaven. We think that somehow we can be good enough. But Paul said this, he said, but watch this. He said, well, I don't have time, but he said, uh, well, we got to. Take a left, go back to 2 Corinthians because I, I, you have to see this. I, I can't trust that you're going to listen to me. And chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Even to this day, watch this, when Moses is read, he's talking about the Old Testament, the law, works mentality. He said, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. That was the problem with Nicodemus. Look at verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Do you see that? This is, uh, Therese is a Presbyterian. Uh, Julie's Presbyterian uh, sometimes Baptists and Presbyterian get into a little bit of a squabble over this issue of Calvinism predestination, free will this is where we have difficulty right here because in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 and verse 15 he says this he says even to this day when Moses is read a veil covers their heart but whenever anyone turns to the Lord we see that as free will, transitive versus intransitive in the verb form. We see not God turning us, but because of our sin, because of our lostness, we turn to Christ. And in that moment when we repent and we turn to the Lord, the Bible says that God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, cuts away that veil, that carnal, fleshly nature, that attempt to work our way towards salvation. God removes the veil, and thereby God's Holy Spirit comes into the heart and regenerates us, and we're alive. 
And we are what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, as we said in the Shona Bible in Africa, Munofanira Kuperveka Pachba, which means this, God, Jesus, said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And the only way he can do it is to let go of the works and the law and the Old Testament in Nicodemus 1 and realize that in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, that it is the shadow and here's the one that's casting the shadow. And if you'll repent and put your faith and trust in me, Nicodemus, you will be regenerated, saved. The great danger is, particular individual right now that for years I watched this pilgrimage, this journey a dear precious person but every Old Testament festival this person would come up to me and say it's the day of atonement it's the feast of tabernacles it's the day of uh, what it, it's Purim they would always tell me the latest date on the Old Testament calendar and every time that happened, I felt a sickness and a nervousness. And I would think about what Paul said to the people at Colossians. He said this, he said, he said don't, Colossians 2, in fact, let me just get you to turn there, take a right from 2 Corinthians Colossians chapter 2. Look what Paul said here. I would think about these words. Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. And it's important that you use your Bible today. Paul said, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Watch what he says here again. These are what? What are they? These are a shadow of the things that were to come to reality. However, no, the reality is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen. His unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. You see what Paul was saying? Paul was saying, listen, don't go back to the old, once you've been converted. He's talking to the church at Colossae. He's talking to Christians. He said, listen, that veil's been cut away from you. Don't go back. Don't go put the veil back on. Don't go back into that Old Testament, that old system, walking in the law. Be careful because if you do that, it can blind you and cripple you and keep you from ever living the life that anybody will ever be attracted. You know, Paul said it. Look at, take a left from Hebrews and go to Galatians chapter 3. Watch what Paul said here in Galatians chapter 3 because it's the great danger to you and I. The great danger to you and I is Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. And I, I need to stop here and say something. Sheila said a while back about somebody uh, it may have been a work situation she kind of smiled or it may have been a patient or somebody she said you know she said sometimes people are nice to me because they know I'm a Christian and they're kind of spooked in other words they don't want to mess with me because they're afraid sometimes we can see people as having a reputation for being deeply spiritual and they spook us into silence They create more unpardonable sins. They take the law and attach it to grace. Let me say this. One time I was called to a church in Zimbabwe. I had to address something that made me so heavy in my heart that my chest was hurting. I was holding my chest. 
And I made this statement. I said, if I drop dead, may you know that you heard a word from God. If I die, I take nothing back in what I'm preaching to you now. You and I must understand something for somebody to be saved, even Nicodemus. When he repents and turns, and he did because he became a follower of Christ, he and Joseph of Arimathea, he became a follower of Christ. When he repents, and you and I repent, in that moment of turning to Christ, the Holy Spirit cuts away that veil and we realize that it is not by works. It will never be by work. It is simply by the grace and the mercy and the undeserved covenant-keeping love of God. And the great danger in Galatians 3, chapter 1, 2, and 3 is this. Look at this. We'll close in a moment. Paul said, you foolish Galatians. Paul only uses these words one time. Watch what he says, who has bewitched you. Now, we're not talking about the TV series here. Watch what he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Listen to this. Did you receive this Holy Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? In other words, what Paul was writing to this church in Galatians, what he was just simply saying, he only uses this word one time, bewitched. In fact, look on over to Galatians 3, 10 through 13. Watch what Paul said here. He said, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by what? Faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. You know what Paul simply said here? Paul simply said this to the Galatian church. He's talking to believers. He's saying, I am amazed that you are bewitched you begin this walk in grace, but at some point you grabbed hold of the Old Testament. You grabbed hold of the works. You grabbed hold of the law. And you begin, rather than walking it out in the Holy Spirit, in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you begin to grade. And now listen, this is critical. Please look this way. You grade it not only now yourself based on your performance of the law, but you begin to cast judgment on everybody else. And whatever sin you were having victory over, you begin to just throw and sling that venom all over social media. And you're pushing away those who are yet to be saved. Paul said, you've been bewitched. You're walking by the law. You've allowed the enemy somehow to bring that Old Testament veil back on to around to encase your heart and it won't work. You've been redeemed. You've been set free from the penalty of the law. You've been saved. You've been sanctified. Paul said to the Corinthian church, you sanctified. You mean the man that's living with his father, with his stepmother? You mean the, Paul would address him as sanctified, holy? You mean even when Paul sent the church to admonish him, Paul said, listen, don't be too hard on him in 2 Corinthians. Don't overdo it. The problem is there are too many cowards in the church and too many cowards on social media and shame on us for allowing people to throw this theological nonsense out there and absolutely alienating not only people from ever coming to Christ, but it's harsh and judgmental and unfeeling. Paul said, you've been set free of that. 
what happens. Revelation 12 says, the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies. What does the accuser of the brethren do? He does exactly what he did in the book of Job. When he's standing up there before God and God says, uh, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him. He's blameless. <laughs> Satan laughs at a sovereign God. You know what Satan is doing? Satan is doing before God about Job what Satan does even today. What he does in your head, what he does in my head. He is the accuser of the brethren. The word Satan, diabolos, the devil, means slanderer. He is a slanderer in your head that will beat you up with the law. He will have you carrying out a performance of righteousness that is void of his love and his mercy and his goodness. Let me explain it this way. If Osama bin Laden had not been killed and been captured and had been brought, and many felt like he should have been, brought to stand trial in New York City where nearly 3,000 people lost their life. In the courtroom, when the judge finally said, the evidence is in, Osama bin Laden, you are guilty. You can stand. Is there anything you wish to say? Is there anything you wish to say? before you are sentenced to the families of nearly 3,000 people that you killed their dads, their moms, their husbands, their wives, their children. Is there anything that you wish to say? He looks and says, well, listen, here's a quarter. Maybe that'll help with the funeral expenses. That's exactly what you and I do when we bring up our best day before a holy, sovereign God when we somehow think we're living a pretty good life and thereby we can not only, we can not only judge ourselves now, we begin to pass judgment on everybody else. We are flipping a coin in the face of a sovereign God and making a mockery of his grace. Corinthian believer was tragically, tragically carnal. Was practically ungodly and moral. Everything about them. And yet positionally, Paul calls them holy. Paul calls them saints. The only way for you and I ever to be saved is simply by putting our faith and our trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's it. Church member, listen, church membership is not going to save you. Being baptized is not going to save you. Hey, you can show up and up here and you can do everything possible. You can sweep, mop, you can vacuum, you can, you can do whatever you want to do. But it doesn't make a dime's worth of difference on the day of judgment. Unless you and I have repented of our sin and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there is no alternative. There is no plan B. That's it. And when you do that, when you do that, the Bible says that you're saved, sanctified. This person has moved away from everything, even the eternal security of the believer. And that same thing can happen to every single one of us if we're not careful and we constantly are not reminding ourselves, God, I am saved by your grace and mercy and it's not my works. And listen, that's when, I'm, that's when I got saved. That's right now and that's in the future. If I sin, I'm going to be convicted. If I keep sinning, I'm going to be feeling the disciplinary hand of God. If I continue to do that, God may just call me home. Because to whom the Lord loves, he chastens. The veil's been taken away if you're a Christian. If you're not, it's there right now. You think, you think watching 
you think that you can do enough good, enough works, enough good deeds to tip the scales. You can't. Jesus already tipped them for you. And if you're a Christian and you're getting caught back up in laws and you're beginning to measure yourself according to what you believe to be a good life and good deeds, and you're not only weighing yourself, but you're beginning to judge other people, then the reality is you're extremely far away from what God intended. You are now walking by the law. And you are allowing that veil to come back around your heart and your mind. Don't let it. Let's stand. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, I preach with, a, with an urgency this morning, with a seriousness. Lord, my heart is heavy. Lord, I, Dwayne made the statement. He, Dwayne made the statement. He said, you know, uh, ain't nothing good on Facebook. I'm, I'm getting where I think the same thing. Satan is called the prince of the air. And boy, has he proved it. Through the internet, through Facebook, through Twitter. Lord, the, the satellite systems that are circling this globe, dear Lord, the, the, the things that are coming through the air have the ability to confuse and cloud our thinking and to remove us and to move us away from what we know to be biblically and theologically correct. Jesus would say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel. You're the teacher. You memorize the Old Testament. You're not, you're, not, you're not the student, you're the professor. You're not merely a professor at the university, you're the president of the university. And yet you don't know these things. Lord, I pray today if there's a man or a woman, a boy or girl who's listening right now, and they are banking on the fact of living a good life, if they're sitting there thinking to themselves, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to live a good life, I'm going to, I'm going to do the best I can, and and I'm going to mount up as many good deeds as I can. May they realize that the Bible says that our real righteousness is filthy rags to a sovereign God. That we're saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. It's not of works. And it'll never be by works. And Lord, I pray for those that, dear Lord, may be here today that do not know Christ. That's their thinking and they don't realize their heart beat away from eternity and standing before a holy God who will look at them and say, all your good deeds were not enough. That wasn't enough because there's still sin. It's like that toothpaste stain I talked about last week. No matter how hard we wash, no matter what we do, we can't get rid of it. David said, my sin is ever before me. Oh, by the way, David was, David himself was an adulterer and a murderer. saved pray dear Lord for others that may be listening dear Lord they are a child of God but their joy has been stolen taken away they live in bondage to the law oh they've got plenty of people to beat them up to whether they be this or that whether their sin is public or private Lord isn't that funny sometimes we judge people on what sins are pu public when we have many private sins that nobody knows about. But I pray, dear Lord, for the child of God, the Christian, who's trying to walk it out in faith, and right now they're getting beat up by the accuser of the brethren. And that accuser's tag team with a lot of confused people who are taking their misguided theology, unbiblical theology, and they're beating up and they're destroying, they're hurting a lot of people. And I pray, dear Lord, if anyone has fallen victim to that, that you would help them to realize that, God, you love them. And you said, Jesus, if you fathers know how to love your children, I said at the beginning of this sermon, that I've said to my children, uh, I may fail, but I'm going to fail on loving you too much. I told my children, I said to them, you may, you may become a drug dealer, pimp, I don't know, prostitute. You may do whatever you may do with your life. You may break the fellowship with your dad, but you'll never break the relationship. And the only thing that I would ever ask would be repentance and a return to me. Lord, outside, there's only one unforgivable, unpardonable sin. 
and you made it very crystal clear it is denial of the Holy Spirit and for a person who may be here today that would deny you the Holy Spirit you're speaking to their heart and they feel in their heart they know they need to give their life to you but they are saying no no not this time not right now uh, what will people think pride goes before a fall and maybe right now they need to surrender and say Lord come into my heart and forgive me for others that are being beat up by Satan accuser of the brethren they've allowed they've allowed this walk to begin spiritually as Paul said in Galatians 3 they're now walking in the flesh they're now walking in the law they're now measuring themselves and no wonder they're miserable and no wonder people around them are so miserable because dear Lord outside of the grace we would all be miserable I love this song that we sang David Crowder he fumbled he struggled with those words sloppy wet kiss in the song a moment ago were they too were they, was it too much no for any man that's lost a child in a crowded mall to grab that little boy or little girl up in their arms again and give them a sloppy wet kiss for the father who ran to greet the prodigal and wrapped his arms around and put a robe on him and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. I'm sure it was a sloppy wet kiss. To the mother who came out wiping her hands, crying and running across that field as she saw that reunion. Oh, Lord, running with everything in her. It was a sloppy wet kiss. My boy is home. Oh, but Lord, there's the elder brother. Angry, bitter life. Unwilling to come in and celebrate. Harsh, judgmental, condemning this, this son of yours who wasted the inheritance. He addresses the father as if he were not even his brother. And the old man puts his hand around the arm around the elder brother and he said oh son everything that I have is yours won't you come in and celebrate with me God forgive us for being cowards may we have the tenacity and the boldness to confront unbiblical untheological biblical garbage that threatens the very commission, the great commission of Christ. Speak to us, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You come, may there never be a moment like this moment to be saved. You may be watching live stream. You may be watching later and God's speaking to your heart and you may need to come. You may need to bow right there on your knees in your living room, wherever you may be. And you may need to say today, Lord, I repent. Come into my heart. I'll never be able to work my way to heaven. It's Jesus. And Lord, I receive that free gift right now. If you're struggling as a Christian and you've been walking by the law and you're just absolutely miserable, may you get a fresh dose of his forgiving love, his grace, and his mercy. Let him come into your heart. Let him help you. Let him help you have victory over that sin which does so easily beset you. Let him set you free.